Hare Krishna. I'm grateful to be here with all of you today. I'm going to be discussing the appearance of Krishna and we'll try to understand it at four different levels. And what does this four-level understanding mean? Broadly speaking, Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains that Krishna Leela itself can be understood at multiple levels. And I'll explain what Bhaktivinoda Thakur says initially briefly. Then after that, I'll explain how we can apply that paradigm to Krishna's appearance. So, whenever stories are heard, now stories can be of different kinds. Stories can be histories, those which have happened. Stories can be fables. Fables are basically made up stories that imagine they're not, they're not events that have happened, but they're made up stories which convey some moral lessons. So there are Aesop's fables, there are Panchatantra tales. Now, stories can be myths. Now, myth, the word myth is a little polarizing word because the word myth sometimes conveys the idea of imaginary and generally we rebel against the idea of the, the scriptures and the stories within them being called imaginary. But it also has a less evaluative idea and a more, that is, it doesn't convey the idea of imaginary as influential. Influential means like this is the, this, this person's character has become mythical in the Indian imagination or in the Indian mind. I mean, that character has become larger than life. So myth means a mythical story that is a myth is a very influential story. So it's not necessarily an evaluation of its judgment. Sorry, if it's an evaluation of its reality. It's more a statement about its uh, influence. So that's why, say, when we write books, say, I read in the book on the Rama and other devotees have written books, they are put in mainstream publishing houses. They publish them and then they put them in their bookshelves. They will classify them in the domain of mythology or in the mythology. Now, we can debate the point that whether that should be the classification, but that's the existing classification right now. Now, apart from that, there are just anecdotes. Anecdotes means that things which we have personally experienced, oh, this happened to me over here, this happened to me over there. So this may seem to be a very mundane way of starting off, but I am, I, I, the reason why I'm doing this right now, that Generally speaking, there is a big division or among, when it comes to Krishna Leela, the big division in how it is understood by insiders, we could use the word devotees for insiders, and we could use the word outsiders for non-devotees. But it is those who are a part of the tradition and those who are not a part of the tradition. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur tried to, so insiders, Think of them as literal history. This is exactly how it happened. Outsiders often think of them as something like fables, made up stories. And especially when, if we come to Krishna Leela and Krishna's childhood pastime, especially, there doesn't seem to be that much to learn from those pastimes. So, because of that, the problem that comes is that people start thinking of this. What is the point of these stories? So Bhaktivinoda Thakur wanted to build a bridge. So we'll try to apply that approach and we'll see how things move forward today. So the approach he uses is he takes a conventional analytical framework. He said there are three levels of adhikar. The word adhikar means authority. But Adhikar can also mean qualification. The three levels, Kanishtha, Madhyama, and Uttama. Now, we generally use these terms to refer to devotees at different levels. 
But these are general classificatory terms where there are people at different levels in general. And when people are at different levels, they analyze things differently. So he says, the Kanishthas see everything at a literal level. Since the story, oh, and it's a great story. This is exactly how it happened and that's all there is to it. But he says there are people who are more analytical, more intellectual. They want something to contemplate. They want something to analyze, something to dive deep into in their intelligence. So, Vishwanath Thakur also says that the bhag he takes the metaphor of churning and he says the Bhagavatam can be churned first using buddhi and then using bhakti. So it's a very interesting way. Like when we churn at different levels, we get different understandings. So in the, in the Amrut Manthan Leela, the churning was happening. Different things came out due to the churning. So we could say there are some people who want to churn using their buddhi. What does this mean? What does that mean? But he says this is that there are some people who may want to have some ethical lessons from this. Oh, what is this? What, what can we learn from this? What does this signify? So this is where often life lessons come in. Okay, these characters acted like this in this situation. And we can act like this. We can learn this. So ethical is there. So for example, Ravan abducted Sita or Mantara uh, influenced Kaikai. So that is indicative of how bad association Especially submission to bad association can be very damaging. How lust can be damaging. That's ethical. Now beyond that is allegorical. In the allegorical level, we look and our scripture themselves are not allegorical, but there is some symbolic meaning. At the literal level, people are just primarily interested in entertainment. Oh, I have heard a nice story and I enjoy the story. At the ethical level, People are interested in guidance. Okay, what can I learn from it? Then at an allegorical level, there is some kind of illumination. Some symbolic meaning is there, so I which intellectual illumination comes in. And in our tradition also, it is there. Say, for example, we have the idea of Ravan representing lust. So at the allegorical level, the key question is not just who is Ravan, but what is Ravan? And then, the allegorical is the Madhyama level. But then, he goes forward. In one sense, he is patting on the back those who are analytical, those who are intellectual. Yeah, you know, there are people who just simply hear the story for entertainment. You are more intelligent. You are looking for some deeper meaning. He appreciates them. But then, comes the real twist. Yes, but you are not at the highest level. There is a level that is the that is highest. And at that level, you churn with the rod of bhakti. And this is the devotional level. Now, you know, Thakur doesn't use the word ethical and allegorical. He just uses the broad word non-literal levels. So, the Madhyama want to look for non-literal meanings. And then there's a Paramarthic, transcendental, adhyatmic divine meaning at devotional levels. So we could put this as L-E-A-D, lead. Or we can lead people towards Krishna increasing appreciation. So at the devotional level, the, what is sought is simply absorption, ecstatic absorption. A devotee just simply loves to hear about Krishna. And it is said Mahaprabhu would like to hear Guru Maharaj passed him a hundred times, Prasad Maharaj Leela a hundred times. More, just like over the saying, Aniyor, Aniyor, I want to hear more. So eat more. So, like that, the devotee's mood is Aniyor. Now, the key thing is at a superficial level, the literal and the devotional can seem similar, but they are not. The literal is not the same as devotional at all. At the literal level, as I said, the person's interest is only in entertainment. And that's why if they hear one story, and after that, if they don't, okay, that story is over, they may hear Krishna Lila or Ram Lila, they hear about 
Jatayu being killed, they hear about uh, Vimanyu being killed, and they have tears. And as soon as the TV get that particular TV show gets over, switch off the that turn on another channel, and they watch a cricket match. And if their favorite batsman gets out, they also cry over them. So there is no higher direction of emotion. There is no detachment. At a devotional level, fully no interest in anything other than Krishna. Now, of course, as a service, if a devotee has to be interested in other things, then a devotee can do that. But there is no attraction towards it. There is no attachment to it. Ananya manaso, the mind is completely absorbed in Krishna. So this is the level, if you got a devotional level, this is the way we see it as Leela. Leela means it's simply the reciprocation of love between the Lord and his devotees. Another difference is that there is no capacity for analysis at the literal level. There is, on the other hand, there is no need for analysis, even if capacity is there. What does that mean is that if required, that those who are at the analytical, uh, the devotional level, they can also do sophisticated analysis if required. But that is not their need that they have to do it. The non-literal level, that those are the Madhyama level, they need that kind of analysis. So that's what convinces them. There's some substance over here. So let's look at this and we'll try to understand Krishna's appearance. So, Jayati Dedhikam Janmana Vraja Gayata Indira Sakiva Dadrati Daita Drishnata Dikutavata Vaitisatava Swami Kimbhati is the first verse from the Gopi Gita. And this itself indicates something special over here. At the literal level, what happens is, is the story that is interesting. So the story that is interesting means that at this level, a person is primarily interested in how, is, how entertaining is the story. That's why somebody is watching a movie and their primary concern is, hey, don't tell me the story. Don't, 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 don't spoil the suspense. But the suspense is spoiled, then what happens? The person starts thinking, okay, it's a spoiler. So often in movie reviews, there's a spoiler alert. That there's no spoiler review like that. So the idea over here primarily is that Krishna, when we hear Krishna Leela, at a literal level, people want to know news some new story, an old story. Oh, I've heard this. I want to do some lecture shopping. People aren't interested in going deeper necessary. But even from a literal perspective, Krishna's appearance is fascinating. In this particular verse, I quoted Jayati Te Ikam Janyamana Braja. This is one of the pramanas that Jiva Goswami uses to emphasize the point that Krishna's appearance is not as simple as it seems. So the gopis. Here, when they are praying, they are not just uh, sentimental cowherd girls who are just maddened because they are separated from their object of love. They are actually speaking at a very elevated level of emotion, but also wisdom. That's how they are also talking that our future asuras are going to come. They are saying, my, my atma jat. That you will provide us from protect us from your master in future. You have protected us in the past, you will protect us in the future. Why are you not protecting us now? How can you let us die now? So they are enlightened sages. They are also saying that Satvatam Kule, you are born in the Satvat Kula. That means Satvat Kula is actually, it can mean you are a, uh, you are a saintly enlightened person. You are born in the but it also means the Satvatas is one of the Vamishas in the Mathura. So they know about Krishna's identity. And when they using the word Janmana Vraja, so what it means is that they are, this is a Pramana, one of the many Pramanas that Jiva Goswami uses to illustrate that. Krishna 
was born in Vrindavan also. So let's try to understand the story at the literal level itself. And we will try to piece together some of the missing pieces that are there in the story. Now, the way the story begins in the Bhagavatam is before the actual event. Generally speaking, whenever a, say a movie starts or a novel starts, there are two ways to start it. One is just start right from the middle of the action and then go backward and tell. Like start with some fighting going on and some big action scenes going on and then afterwards and okay, who is this person? Who is that person? And why are they fighting? That's one way to do it. The other is actually build up. Build up through the little background. Okay, what, what is the significance of this fighting? Who is this person? Who is that person? And then fight. So then bring the fight, then they bring the key action. There are different approaches. So the Bhagavatam begins the 10th canto, which is talking about the appearance of Krishna with some backstory. So the backstory is related in three different ways. First, it just creates the dramatic setting for Krishna's appearance, how dramatic and how dangerous the setting in which he appears. Second is, it also brings out the character of the characters, how evil comes size. And it also brings out how significant the appearance, significance or the significance of Krishna's appearance. So now we know the backstory is what? That it starts with Kamsa arresting his own father. The Kamsa's cruelty is shown in the Bhagavatam in many different ways. So it's sometimes you can say this person is a terrible demon. Okay, why should I believe it just because you say it? No. He arrests his own father. He takes away the throne from his own father. We know that in the in the Islamic rule of India, that's what Aurangzeb did. Aurangzeb took the throne from his father and imprisoned his father in the same, in a prison where it was very close to the Taj Mahal, but he couldn't see the Taj Mahal. Then he but that's brutal. And there's another son of his. And he killed that son and lopped off his head and gave that head as a gift to his father. So, brutality. So, uh, Gamsa arrested his father and kept him in the control. And he was a tyrant. Now, although he's a tyrant, even tyrants don't like to be seen as tyrants. So, he wanted to act with him. Thus, when is uh, another another exact sequence is that he he start he had a depraved nature, but the depraved nature comes out in different ways. Uh, he arrests Sugrasen, that incident comes start that is a that is a manifestation of his evil nature. How does that evil nature start off? At many levels, but at one level he's acting like a good person. Suddenly there is a Akashwani. He is taking his sister, actually she's the cousin's sister. Devki is taking her, is driving her chariot after her wedding. Showing the world what a devoted brother I am. Recently, just a few days ago, there was a Raksha Bandhan. So, the idea that a brother should protect a sister. He's embodying that. In one moment, that Raksha Bandhan becomes the Mrutyu Bandhan. He's catching her by the hair and ready to lop off her head. See, here's one Akashwani. Child, the Ashtagarbha will be the cause of your death. Ready to forget all the loss. You know, the level of sinfulness over here is unbelievable. It's, he's not even trying to cover it up. He, in, so, first of all, for a man to attack a woman is bad. For a Kshatriya who is meant to protect women, for a Kshatriya to attack a woman is far worse. For a brother to attack his sister is even worse. For a Kshatriya to attack his sister on her wedding day, that is, if you consider sin, sin square, sin cube, sin raised to the power of four. And then to do it on the wedding day in public, in front of everyone. So, 
to surrender because sin raised to the power of five. So generally, when people do bad things, they try to hide it and do it. If they do it in public, public means not just public, but all other kings were there. Also, they was there. Ukrasen was there. In their presence, when he is doing this, what does it mean? He does not have any fear of the law. The law has fear of it. Is the kind of demon he is. Once this nature comes out, then he starts doing all kinds of other things. Like I said, he arrests Ugrasen. He persecutes everyone else who he sees as a threat. The Yadur, seeing his demoniac nature, some of them flee from there, and some of them just act as if they are supporting him. Some of them actually become his supporters, a few of them. And then this is the setting where he's ruling. And among the various demons, Kamsa, like Ravan is always lusty. Ravan is almost always evil. But Kamsa has his mood swings. So at one moment, he's cruel. At one moment, he's kind. Next moment, he becomes cruel. Then again, he becomes kind. So Vasudev somehow uses some emergency advice, emergency argument, emergency reasoning, emergency pleading, and gets him to spare them. This is the bond of responsibility. That although they got married just now, there's no long-term relationship there, but immediately that sense of responsibility that she's my wife, I have to protect her to whatever it takes to protect her. It is her sons that are the threat to you, I'll give her sons. Okay. He promises that and comes up and leaves him. And also they dutifully accuse his son. And then comes up and says, okay, I have no threat from the first son. I only want the eighth child. And so they goes back, but he's not renewed. He still knows. This kind of people can change their mind at any mind at any moment. Uh, the mind of demoniac people is like a horse. It's not just like a horse, it's like those who are obeying them, those who are trusting them, those who are relying on them. Like they are riding a horse, and suddenly when the horse is going very fast, they're told, okay, go from this horse to that horse. What? How can I do that? How you have to do that and keep going at the same pace? Like they change their mind. So fast and they expect everyone else to submit to them and do accordingly. It's very difficult to work with such people. So anyway, what he does is, he demands this. One moment he says, your son is safe. But then Narad Muni comes and tells him, he will say, which is the first child if you take a petal of lotus. Which is the first. So why does Narad Muni seem to incite? See, actually, we could say, why is Narad Muni inciting him? We could even say, why did the Akashwani come first? Krishna would have just appeared and killed Kamsa. He did not have to give the Akashwani at all. Because of that, Kamsa did so much atrocities. Because of this, Vasudev Devaki had to be in prison. Because of that, you know, their six children were killed. So actually, when Krishna comes, he doesn't just want to kill the demons. He wants the world to know how demoniac they are. Then this danger at that time, how does one use one's power? Is the real test of a person's character. See, anybody can have again power if they have some intelligence, some shrewdness, some cunning. But after gaining power, when there is danger, do they abuse that power and show their character? So Krishna abuses his power big time. How evil he is, Krishna shows that to the backstory. And Narati is simply giving him reasons at one level to bring out his true colors. And he says, okay, I'll kill all the children. And it cannot be a worse nightmare for parents than, than to have that child not just die, be killed in front of them. So what kind of brutality is required to do something like that? Let us just hear the story, but we may not even think about it. A parent loses one child, sometimes somebody loses a child even to miscarriage. They not even they never saw the child. But they lose that child and cause it so much pain. The child is born, the child comes out, you see the child, and look at the child. He comes out so cold hearted, he would kill the children right in front of them. So, Sudev and Devki could have been traumatized by this. They, they continued to help children. Because they knew something bigger was going to come to this. 
they knew that the world needed to be delivered from a tyrant like Kamsa, and they had to suffer for it. They were ready to do it. But then the seventh child, the sixth child, children were killed. The seventh child disappeared. Apparent miscarriage was there, and the eighth child was dramatic. It, we so here will go parallel to Vrindavan. Now in Vrindavan, there is an appearance of Krishna. That is the claim of Jiva Goswami. So, what is the basis of this claim? There are several verses in the Scripture itself in the Bhagavatam and other places, which which indicate that Krishna was born in Vrindavan. So, we do know that Asud that Ishodamai also gets pregnant after a long, long time. In fact. For her, uh, see, Vasudev and Devaki, Vasudev and uh, and Manda Maharaj, they have different sets of problems. Vasudev and Devaki, they are having children, but they are losing children. Manda Maharaj and Ishwada they are just not able to have children. It goes on and on. And nowadays, many pictures are made. Ishwada Mai shown as quite young. Ishwada Mai and Manda Maharaj, are, they, they are healthy, but they are not very young. So they are I mean, middle aged. So it's almost given up hope of having a child. It's, they do some special tapasya. He becomes pregnant. So they're waiting, he's waiting. And then the appearance of Krishna happens at both places. Well, Vrindavan in Mathura. Now in Mathura, there's a whole complex backstory. In Vrindavan, the, the two backstory is not that much. The two significant things about Vrindavan uh, are that and the Maharaj, although he's not the eldest brother, he's the most qualified. And that's why, although Upananda is the eldest, he says, Nanda, you should become the king. So he's the king. That's why his position is even more significant, and yet he does not have a child. So although he is a Vaishya and uh, Vasudeva is a Kshatriya, they have affection and respect among each other. So we see here that uh, there's whole propaganda about the discrimination in the caste system in India. In the morning, so they, they have very good friendship. And now we could go backwards and they are related also. A lot of complex, a lot of nuances in the story. But it was, it was division of labor, not segregation of people based on caste. Everybody had their place and res respectful place, respectable place in society. He was considered a leader among the Vaishya. So the Kshatriya is the king of the entire kingdom. But every community will have its own leaders. And those community leaders are also respected by the particular by, by the followers of that varana and by the higher authorities also. So he's significant, uh, significantly important. And second is that he doesn't have a child for a long, long time. And that's why when they get a child, it's not just that Nanda Maharaj and Ishwada are happy, they are very beloved as leaders over there. So all of Vrindavan is happy that our king and queen are now having a child. So this is the backstory in both places. Now, when two events are to happen, there are two three significant things over there. Sudev and Devaki, when now the literal story, when it is when it's a literal story is as events transpire as they happen. So there are some significant things. It's it's like a point. There's always this in this world tension between light and dark. The forces of goodness, goodness and the forces of evil. And Krishna appears at midnight. There's often the question that is raised that. If Kamsa was so afraid that uh, of the eighth child of Devaki, he could have just kept Kosudev and Devaki in separate cells. And then there would have been no problem. Actually, the point was that first of all, Krishna did not appear by ordinary means of physical union. He said that Krishna appeared first in the heart of Kosudev, then the heart of Devaki, and then he transformed into the her womb, and then he appeared. He appeared. With a with hair on his body, with with the ornaments, effulgent form, didn't appear like ordinary being. 
So even if they had been kept separate, that would not have made any difference. The second more important, now we may say this is not what Kamsa knew. So, but why did Kamsa did not keep them separate? Kamsa had a huge ego. And his ego was that he wanted to falsify the words of the Devutas. He thought that I have already defeated the Devutas in war. Now, if I can prove that even their words are false, then people will lose all faith in the Devutas. And once that faith is lost, my power will have no more challenge, no more threat. And that is why I will let the child be born and then I will kill the child. So I will show that the one who was supposed to be my killer, I am that person's killer. In that way, I will announce my authority. That was Kamsa's calculation in letting the child be born. So, symbolic that he wanted to create, it's not symbolic, it's instructive. It's a that he wanted to create fear about his power in everyone's hearts. But in that process, it was he who became filled with fear. Hayat Kamsa, it is described in the Bhagavatam. That he would constantly be in fear of Krishna. Even before Krishna appeared, he was in fear. And throughout Krishna's life, he never saw Krishna till Krishna came in Mathura for the wrestling match. He lived in fear of Krishna. So anyway, the point is that Kamsa wanted to create fear of his power in everyone else's heart and also destroy the faith in the Devatas that people might have. So Krishna chose to appear at midnight. Now, again, there's a striking contrast between what happens in Mathura and what happens in Vrindavan. In Mathura, the darkness of midnight and in the very depth of midnight, uh, very, very dark, somehow everybody falls asleep. That is Krishna's yoga maya. Vasudev and Devki, they are shackled, but their shackles break free. But now Krishna appears over there. When Krishna appears, the whole atmosphere becomes illuminated. Not only the outer atmosphere becomes illuminated, Hearts become warm with illumination, with joy, with confidence, with security, with great anticipation. The whole universe becomes celebratory, the appearance of the Lord of the universe. In Vasudeva and Devaki, they're delighted to see Krishna and they offer prayers to Krishna. There is a tension when the Lord appears in this world. And those who relate with the Lord in various rasas, on one side they have their particular rasa in which they want to do the service to the Lord. But at the same time, there is some awareness this is the, that this is the Lord. So Devaki, she offers prayers to Krishna like her husband. But then she says, Krishna, you are in this extraordinary form. How will I hide you? Just, you know, take some more ordinary form. Oh. In one sense, if she knows he is God, why does she have to hide him? And realistically speaking, in that prison cell, where can she even hide him actually? But it just shows her maternal concern. Shikna tells Vasudev, you take me to Nanda Maharaj's place in Rindavan. You leave me there and you come back. And the prison doors open. In that darkness, Krishna brings light. And then Vasudev takes Krishna to Rindavan. Now, that whole story, I won't go into the, the details of that, but let's look at simultaneously in Vrindavan what's happening is that Yashoda has a very long labor and everybody around her, she has assistants, she has uh, maid servants, they're all waiting, but in waiting and waiting, they all become exhausted. And when they become exhausted, at that time, they all fall asleep. And even Yashoda falls asleep. And then, when she has a child that nobody comes to understand her, it's, it's everybody is fast asleep. So it's the same yoga maya at one level puts the guards to sleep but creates illumination in the prison cell. But what is a very comfortable place, uh, home, 
there's no Prabhupada sometimes is the word maternity ward. It's not a maternity ward in the technical sense of the word today. But in the home, which is safe and secure, there is complete darkness. Mm -hmm. Krishna is brought there. Over there is taken by Vasudev. So this is at a literal level the story of how Krishna appeared. The next morning, now in the context, is what is happening in Mathura and what is happening in Vindavan. In Mathura, Vasudev comes back, he brings the girl. Now we may think, what is Krishna doing over here? Okay, Krishna wants to have, be protected. They want to be safe. That's fine. So, but to get some innocent child, to let that innocent child be killed, is that right, the right thing to do? What is that child's fault? Or is that child just being used as a instrument for some higher cause and offered like a offered like a sacrificial pawn? So, there is a higher plan going on. There also. So Kamsa wakes up. As soon as Vasudev comes back, the shackles get fastened on him. And the guards wake up. They inform Kamsa and Kamsa comes charging. And he grabs the sword. And Devki tries to plead with him. He says, she's a girl. Don't kill her. So he's taken aback. It's a girl. But he says, no, let's not take any risk. He says, he raises her. Smash her on the ground just like he has done before with all the previous children. And he raises her, she slips out of her hands with his hands. She rises above, and there appears the effulgent, powerful form of the goddess. Now, so they went, they, they just seen Vishnu, and they now see Devi. And Kamsa is seeing Devi for the first time. He is a worshipper of the goddess. And because he's a worshipper of the goddess, I don't know how this goddess appears. He just, it takes him time to process. Happened over there. She says, You fool. Who, the one whom we are going to, who's going to, one who's going to kill you has already appeared elsewhere. So now, again, the exact Sanskrit, if you go, the commentators have different and done different analysis. Is he, is he, has he already, is he there somewhere else? Has he already appeared somewhere else? Has he been transported to somewhere else? So what does it exactly mean? Depending on how, how we read those particular words, there are different meanings over there. The point is, in Kamsa, things don't register first. So first thing, you know, how did God, the goddess, appear? the goddess whom I worship, appear from Devaki? And it, was a, it was a woman. The goddess had not promised to kill me. She is my worshipable deity. So he immediately had an apparent change of heart. No, oh, I made a simple mistake. I made a please forgive me. Please forgive me. So they are there. It's interesting. It is said that they forgive. Now, it's important to know what forgiveness means and what it does not mean. If forgiveness is for the past, it's not for the future. If somebody has done some past wrongs, we forgive them. But still, they need to earn trust. So, forgiving is not trusting. But Sudev and Devki they said that they forgive Kamsa. But they don't trust him. They don't tell him, oh, actually, you know, I have kept my child in Rundao. What is foolishness? Is his change of heart for real or not? Actions will prove. They don't just take him at face value. They forgive him, but they don't trust him. The forgiveness can be given, but the trust has to be earned through action, not just through words. And Sudev's decision is prone to be right. Because Kamsa soon has a change of heart and he tries terrorizing and killing all the children who have been born recently. But initially, let's also then Devaki go because we start thinking if the goddess appeared from her womb, she must be a special and great soul. And the philosophical knowledge, spiritual knowledge, can be utilized in different ways. So in some of the retellings of the 10th canto, let's say that Kamsa says, really, it's Kalyuga now. Even the Akashwani speaks lies. There was no threat for me. Why did I kill so many children? I'm such a terrible person. Oh, but what can I do? I was misled. You know, as far as you are concerned, it was just destiny that your sons were to be killed. And I happened to be an, an, a mere instrument of destiny. In this way, he tries to give some excuse for his behavior. But then again, 
he goes back to his associates and tells them what has happened and they start thinking hey the goddess said this appeared elsewhere therefore you should do something about it he goes on a rampage killing everyone elsewhere that's where putana comes in but the point is if we look at the story itself it's dramatic over here now in rindavan on the other hand the so no celebration in fact nandotsav which is celebrated after appearance of krishna itself is amazing it's, it's a festive occasion with a spontaneous celebration everybody in the king's joy that krishna has been born that and the man jyoda now have a child so the moods in these two places are very somber and they're very different in the, in mathura it's still somber it's grave it's uncertain in vrindavan it is just unrestricted celebration just pure joy so krishna can evoke different emotions at different times in different people's hearts so now what is described by acharya is that actually sudev that uh, and the mahajan showed that there are different explanations of this narrative but let's keep one of them and then the mahajan showed that actually had two children and because there are two children that's why her her labor went so long and she was so exhausted and in the darkness he did not see two children he saw only one child and he replaced that child and he put his child over there and that krishna that was sudev krishna and that vrindavan krishna sudev krishna is the one who is born to vasudev and vrindavan krishna is the one who is born to nanda mahatma nishoda they became one the other another explanation is that while vasudev was crossing yamuna but krishna fell out of his basket into yamuna so they panicked that what happened over here but he found so during that time vasudev krishna was the krishna who fell in and the vrindavan krishna who was born in to mother yashoda that vrindavan krishna krishna yogmaya arrangement came over here and then the krishna who was picked up was vrindavan krishna so either way the point is krishna was also born vrindavan so even without the additional success additional twist the story is very significant very dramatic because of what all was happened for this child to be born that's at the literal level i described the literal at a somewhat detailed level although we know the story because that is useful and essential in some ways for understanding the story at other levels so l e a d let's look at the ethical level at so the ethical level there are three different perspectives or three different points that we can consider the first is from the perspective of vasudev and devaki and that's the most important perspective that we have to go through so much difficult so for somebody to be a part of a great cause often they have to go through great trouble a great sacrifice the first volume of prabhupada zilamrut called a lifetime in preparation now that's a very uh, app but at the same time a very soft way of putting it so just a lifetime in preparing and when we say a lifetime in preparation that means okay after you prepare something more is going to come like we have prepared it really for an exam we know exam is going to come we know when we read prabhupad story the spectacular unparalleled success with outreach in later years throughout prabhupad's own life did you know that prabhupad never claimed to be trikalogya prabhupad was trying various things and when he was going through this they were all real struggles is a lifetime of austerity lifetime of setbacks like lifetime of disappointments lifetime of heartbreaks like so many things and none of them worked for him when prabhupad came to america at the age of 69 if he look back at his life he could have seen this all krishna preparing me but it could also seen as none of the things that i have done have really worked till now Because he had written the Bhagavatam, he had started back to God magazine. He stopped it. He had got written the Bhagavatam. He had got the Prime Minister of India the endorsement, the President's endorsement, but it had not really caught up and become a big bestseller. It was something which he was there. He had started League of Devotees. He had had to drop it. His family business, his his business did not work out at all. 
his family was not all supportive of not their pious but they not really supportive of his missionary spirit so in one sense prabhupad had nothing literally to show for his efforts till that time suddenly krishna gave so much so for preparing for a great cause for contributing to a great cause he may have to go through great difficulty vasudev and devaki show that they are ready for that krishna is actually waiting for us to become ready But what is becoming ready mean? It means that we need to accept that Krishna's plan. When we say it's bigger than us, it is better. It is bigger than our plan. It is better than our plan. Sometimes a bigger and better plan may require the utter parting of our plans, the crushing of our dreams. Sometimes we see all the things we invested our life in come crumbling down. And sometimes it doesn't just crumbling down; it crashes down, and it causes the ground under us to crumble, and we don't even have anywhere to stand. So it's utterly devastating. So if we think of it from the emotional perspective, the price that Vasudev Devan Devki had to pay for having Krishna was in to lose, to lose them all in front of their eyes. You will know that the next child is going to be born, like when the next child is also going to die. And it was not that their sacrifices stopped at that. That we have a child and we don't, we can't even take care of that child. We can't see that child. We can't hug that child. We can't even let that child know that we are its parent. That we care for it. You think as painful as that for a parent. So he, it's not that even after Krishna appeared, suddenly Krishna said everything magically. From an ethical perspective, they had to keep paying the price even after Krishna appeared. They were everything. They were Mathura. They couldn't even they could never go to Vrinda, even when they were not arrested. They are going to Vrindavan. Would have raised red flags, and they didn't want that. Happen at all. They didn't want Kamsa. But all his suspicions confirmed. So, was they knew that Kamsa was sending demons. They knew that Vrindavan something dangerous was happening. They knew Krishna was being protected miraculously. Whether Krishna is protected today, whether he is protected the next day, he will be protected the next day. So. Was it was heart wrenching, heart wrenching suspense for them. They had to go through it all. Krishna came back. When Krishna came back, so they say, "Yet that agre vishamiva pariname amruto kama." In the beginning, it is poison. Then there is nectar. But the problem is, in the beginning, how long is the beginning going to go on? One year? Is it one month? Is it ten years? Is it twenty years? It's like somebody is put in the jail, and they don't know how long they're going to be in jail. It's very difficult. Okay, if I know it is going to be for this much period, it's painful to be in a jail. But at least if we know how much period it is, it's relatively easier. We don't even know that. It was that trauma, the agony which we were to hear that in Parinama, Amrito, Pamu, that nectar that Krishna gave them. Krishna just appeared and effortlessly killed Kamsa. We are sure of everyone that he was comes out no threat for anyone at all, least of all for Krishna. What Krishna did was extremely endearing. You know, parents when if they have a child with great talent, with great ability, it's a matter of like pride. Ch- child is so good at music. My child is so good at maths. My child is so good at this. That's wonderful. Then. Mm-hmm. If the child doesn't just have ability, but also has virtues, the child also say has humility. Say, say a child wins some big competition, big championship, and then after that is called to give a speech. And in that speech, the child just gives credit to everyone. You know, my parents, my friends, my coach, my teachers. They start bragging about how great I am. Ability attracts the mind, but humility conquers the heart. 
So Krishna kills Kamsa, but what does he do after that? He doesn't claim the crown for himself. In fact, he, even when the Yadus offer him the crown, he says, he accepts the crown and he goes to Grasa. He says, this is your crown. He's accepted. He says, no, no, you should be the king. You are the, you are the person who killed Kamsa. He says, so I take this crown for you. I have no intention for the crown. It is meant for you alone. He requests and he insists and he offers that crown. So seeing disarming humility, his respect for elders, endures their hearts so much. But Krishna goes to Vasudev and Devi. And what does he do at that time? What is that? This is a union between and child and child. I'm of pain and trauma. And for children when they are growing up, and nowadays there's a lot of concern about people having children. Many young people have very difficult childhoods because sometimes the parents are okay. Is it better now? It was not breaking for us, Prabhuji. Continue. Okay. So, so now, suppose among the worst things for a child when they're growing up, you know, parents fighting is one thing, parents bickering in front of the child, that's a, that's a bad thing. But the worst feeling that a child can have is to feel unwanted, is to feel abandoned. My parents would, sometimes parents may not have planned to have a child or something, the family planning goes on and they have a child. It is a talking about it and the child overhears it. It's extremely traumatizing for the child to think that I was not wanted. So, Krishna was abandoned in one sense by the parents. You know, there were reasons, there were extenuating circumstances, but still, Krishna was left by his parents in somebody else's place. Now that we, Krishna could have been angry, Krishna could have been, you know, you abandoned me, you didn't care for me. Uh, there could have been many different reactions at that particular time. Krishna's response to it. Krishna says, the children are meant to serve their parents. I caused you such pain even before I was born. Like, cause of me, those were their kids. You had to watch six of your children die. Because, and even after I was born, I couldn't serve you anymore. It's far away from you. I can't. What can I do? From now onwards, I will serve you. I will try to do my duty as a child. So, in one sense, Krishna had to a disarming way over here. When Yudhishthira comes in front of Bhishma, Yudhishthira is feeling guilty. Because of me, Bhishma is in this bed of arrows. Bhishma is in such pain. And the first thing that Bhishma says is, Apo kashtamaho anyayam yad yuyam dharmanandana. It's most unexpected and most disarming. He says, oh, oh Yudhishthira, how many atrocities and adversities had you to suffer throughout your life, although you are so virtuous. So the entire mood of the discussion is changed. Krishna doesn't just speak the words. Krishna fulfills the heart's longing of Devaki. So Krishna is by now 10 years old. It's quite old. And Devaki had her pregnancy 10 years ago. Krishna by his mystic power arranges that Devaki suddenly has milk in her breast. And he takes that. Basically, it might seem very odd. What is Krishna doing? A mother, one of her mother's Especially a mother who very deeply loves a child, one of her fondest desires, one of the most intimate acts of love is a mother breastfeeding her child. So if you never had that opportunity to do that. So Krishna appeared in that majestic Vishnu form. And Devaki would have not this every pretty one. Now even this Vishnu form, she in this beautiful Sham Sundar kind of form, and he said, Now take me immediately. So Krishna fulfills that desire for you. Even without Devaki requesting it, Krishna is so aware. Sometimes you may wonder, I am suffering over here. 
especially when trying to practice bhakti and still we are struggling and suffering, we wonder, Krishna, I even know what I'm going through. Krishna not only fulfills this desire of Devaki that, that she breastfeed him, but Krishna arranges for the previous six children also to appear. And she breastfeeds them also. And then they disappear. They go to the higher abodes. So Krishna, in this way, that pariname amrutopama, so fulfilling for their hearts. So whenever there is a great cause to be done, great trouble may be required. But at the end, there is a great reward to be had. Prabhupada said that the success that he got in this in Krishna conscious outreach said it exceeded even my own expectations. So, is ethical level we learn from the tribulations of a Sudev and Devaki. What it takes to be able to serve Krishna. Now, another thing at an ethical level we understand is that in this world, there will always be people like Kamsa. And they will have no art. So to kill a child, to kill a small newborn baby, no matter how tough and hard people are, something about baby is seeing them softens the heart. And seeing a baby doesn't soften the heart, there must be something really wrong with that heart. So, for Kamsa to see a small baby, not as a baby who needs protection, as somebody who's a threat, from whom I need protection, so I'll kill this baby. This requires a stress level of perversion of the mind. So, even in Krishna's time, where where people like Kamsa, people like that will be there for us. If we don't encounter them, that's our fortune. But there will be people like this, and they will do ghastly things. So, sometimes when very bad things happen, recently there's news of some um, atrocities in Bangladesh against Hindus. There's a horrific viol violence against women in Calcutta. These are great cases. At the same time, we are just hearing these news. Sometimes people hear these news and start thinking that, oh, where is God? Does God even exist? Does God even care? Vasudev and Devaki, they saw their children being killed. And hey, what is this happening to me? Why is nothing happening to Kamsa? He seems to be in power. He seems to be just, his power is increasing. He's having allies. He's becoming stronger. So Krishna has his plan. Krishna's plan works according to his time. And sometimes there will be people like Kamsa who can create this earth. So it is Krishna himself sometimes intervenes. Dharma samsthapana tha sambhavami yuge yuge. But Sometimes Krishna swayir dor bhair asana dharma. That sometimes Krishna empowers others, like he empowered Arjuna to take down the Kauravan. So there will always be dark people. And while it is very alarming and heart wrenching and dark people do dark things, but we need to know that this is sometimes just the nature of the world and nature of perverted people in this world. You should not neglect. Just the existence of evil people and their evil actions make us lose faith in God. Krishna's plan will work in his time. And we need to wait. We need to be patient. We need to have faith till that time works out. Sometimes we may look at the evil in the world and we start thinking, is there any good? What is the point of being good? It is important for us to be good. But we can't expect that just because I am good, there will be no... Everybody will be good to me. We have to use our intelligence. If somebody goes into a bullfighting ring, the man bull over there, charging towards us. Now we cannot tell that bull, hey, I'm a vegetarian, don't hurt me. Being a vegetarian is a good thing. But that does not mean the bull is not going to hurt us. But there will be evil people in the world. We need to be good, we need to be devoted. At the same time, we need to do what we can to protect ourselves. Vasudev, so rather than losing faith in Krishna, in God, he did what he could. Protected his wife. He protected his child, Krishna, as much as he could by sending him to Vanda um, Maharaj in Vrindavan and hiding that secret as well as he could. 
So sometimes it happens that our kshetra becomes very limited. Kshetra is our power of influence becomes very limited. And sometimes the demon's power of influence becomes huge. And if we fall in that power of influence of the, the demoniac person, then we may be victimized at that time. Now that kshetra is not going to be there forever. Krishna will end everyone's kshetra in due course of time. But during that time, we need to have that faith. And the example of Asudev and Devki, it was not just that they had to go through difficulties, but they were seeing somebody who was causing difficulties and they had to endure that. It's very difficult. And the person who is causing difficulties, nothing seems to be happening to that person. So, it's difficult that. But uh, Shastra give examples that while there is light at the end of the tunnel, definitely, but there can be a very, very dark tunnel. We have many devotees in Ukraine and the war is happening in Russia and Ukraine. Devotees who are being, which Ukraine itself is basically caught in the power struggle between Russia and America. And Ukraine is being offered like a sacrificial pawn over there. And the devotees there are, in UK, I met some devotees when I was there recently. It's a very difficult situation. They have their homes and their, uh, their temples and their flourishing communities. I mean, geopolitical event, and now they're scattered all over the world, trying to rebuild their lives. But still, so many of them are maintaining their devotion. Grateful that they have come to another place where they have other opportunities to practice bhakti. So, we need to hold on to our faith. Even when sometimes people like Kamsa seem to be going on and on in their power. And the third point is that the ethical level, when we look at events, it's important that we don't just look at events in isolation. So for in one sense, Yashoda and Rinda, they never knew what happened. What was eventually a great joy for Osudev and Devaki. Krishna coming back to Mathura and staying there, that became a source of great pain for Vinda and Ishoda. So the Lord's manifest presence is there for some time with us. So Vasudeva and Devaki didn't have Krishna, they didn't forget Krishna. So maybe they were still remembering Krishna. What that means is that for all of us, when we are practicing bhakti, there are we can say there are four quadrants. One is the presence of Krishna. The other is the remembrance of Krishna. Remembrance means the devotional remembrance. Now, we could say this is the, if there is presence and remembrance, that is the easiest. Easiest and the best. Krishna is with us. Say we are in a temple. We are behold, at our level, we may not see Krishna directly. But we can behold him in the temple. The source of remembrance, the presence is there, the remembrance is there. And the worst is when there is presence but no remembrance. This is the example of Duryodhan. Krishna came at Shantidut, Krishna even showed his universal form. But still, what does Duryodhan say? Yeah, this is just some magic. Since Krishna was in Vrindavan, he had no work to do. So he probably did some tapasya and learned some mystic power. And that's why he had to show some form. You know, I'm the hard-working prince throughout my life. If I had some idle time like he had, I would also done some tapasya. I would also show bigger forms than what Krishna did. I just dismiss Krishna's form. It was terrible. Sometimes the presence is there, but there's no remembrance. Now, if there is no presence and there's no remembrance, that is materialism. This is where most people are not. This is the toughest. That there is no presence, but there has to be remembrance. But this is also the most rewarding. So it's like when we are not able to have the presence of Krishna with us, do we remember him at that time? If we do, that really shows our devotion. We, we could have so many other things to turn towards, other things to remember, we don't do that. So for Nanda and Vasudev, although they don't have Krishna with them, they're long, they're longing for Krishna. They are in their Vatsalya bhav, they are actually trying to bring things for Krishna. 
He arranges the Gargacharya go there and do the name giving ceremony discreetly. He gives in charity, although he has nothing to give in charity, he gives in the mind in charity. So they do what they can. Similarly, when Krishna departs from Vrindavan, so Vrinda Maharaj and Ishwara, they don't forget Krishna. Oh, we had this wonderful boy in his childhood, now he has gone, what can we do? Constantly remembering the Lord. So, right, even when the Lord is present on the planet, he may not be present with all his associates at that time. And the glory of those associates is that there is remembrance even and there is no presence. And that is what we need to do. For us on days like Janmashtami, we celebrate the appearance of the Lord on this earth. But what we also want is that the remembrance of the Lord that we get on this day, that remembrance become more and more relishable for us. We develop a taste for that remembrance so that throughout the year, that remembrance may continue. That a ethical level, the test of devotion is when there is not much facility for devotion, do we continue it? Now, at the allegorical level, I'll go through the remaining past. Oh. So, allegorical level, we know again there are uh, there are two different levels of allegory over here. One is that the six children of Devaki, they represent the six anarthas. The six anarthas have to be removed till our heart, so that our heart becomes pure. The Guru appears and then the Krishna, Krishna appears. So, so that means now, if you say this, so when the allegorical is sometimes these four dif different levels when we use for understanding things, it is important that the representative and what it is, what is being represented, the two are not mixed together. What do I mean by this? And when something is spoken at an allegorical level, that's like a symbolism that is hidden over there. Symbolism that is indicated over there. The symbolism should not interfere or override interfere with or override the actual storyline. So if those six children literally represent lust, anger, greed, and even pride and illusion, then why does Krishna bring those children back? Why does Krishna have them breastfed? That's the difference because there it's primarily a reciprocation of love going on. So we should mix these different levels. You have to be careful about that. So at one level, and one understanding is there, another level, another understanding there. Our idea is to get more and more understanding and more and more absorption. So sometimes these different levels may synergize, sometimes they may not. So that's one aspect of the non-literal meaning. The allegorical is that in the process of bhakti, there are plus time, these anarthas, they are there in our hearts and they start appearing. Sometimes what happens is that the, the six children, they don't just die. They don't, it is not that there's, there's miscarriage and they go. They are born, they are seen, then they are destroyed. So sometimes for us, that the lower side within us that is there, that it doesn't just peacefully die. It manifests. The lust that is there, the anger that is there, the greed that is there, that manifests for us, we confront it. And then if we don't let that swerve us away from Krishna, then it disappears. So then, now we may say, Guru is required right at the beginning to even start the process of bhakti. Yes, that is true, no doubt. But the Guru bhakti in a very devoted way manifests when the anarthas are removed. Then Krishna himself appears. So Balramji represents Guru and Krishna is, of course, Krishna. That the eight child represents Krishna appears in our. That is one level of allegorical meaning. Now the second level of allegorical meaning is that Krishna appeared at midnight. So sometimes things have to become very, very dark before they become bright. Sometimes it is it will, like the darkest of times that are there and there doesn't seem to be any hope. But at that time, uh, we turn toward the uh, Namo Inchanavittaya. Kunti Maharaj says, you are the wealth of the impoverished. For us, when there is difficulty in life, we may think, I have light through this difficulty, through my intelligence, through my wealth, through my contacts, through my popularity, through my disability, through this. We all try to find our torches. And yes, we have those abilities, we are meant to use them. But 
these should not take us away from Krishna. Where there's just no hope, even in the best of our ability, nothing seems to be working. There is just utter darkness. It's at that time that Krishna redeems himself. It is that Krishna appears and dramatically transforms everything. So sometimes when we are going through life, we think so much darkness, when is going to end? But it's in that darkness that Krishna will manifest. When Prabhupada went to America, the first year, so was extremely difficult. Prabhupada had gone on a two-month visa to America. The time at the end of the two months, we think, maybe I should go back to India. Nothing is happening over here. But Prabhupada, something is amazing. You know, keep trying. Prabhupada had no idea when his efforts would have success. It seemed to become darker and darker and darker. It was Prabhupada was staying in one David Allen's uh, he was to, uh, David Allen was staying with Prabhupada. And he seemed to be becoming a dis like a disciple, submissive, interested. And suddenly the very person went mad because of drugs and tried to attack Prabhupada. Not only did Prabhupada lose a potential disciple, Prabhupada lost the only place that he had to stay. And he was on, had to leave that place running and be on the streets. Homeless. So what to do? Probably a, a darkest period for the Prabhupada. But there, yeah, rather than losing hope, hope, although he had lost, he had, he had been he had lost his hope, he did not lose his hope. Prabhupada's hope ultimately was at Krishna's lotus feet. And then he just called some people who were uh, come for his program, and he said, This has happened, and they moved him temporarily to somebody's home, and from there they got the 26th Second Avenue, and from there things started looking up. So for us, things will look up. But if things are not looking up, then we should be looking up. Not that we look, because things are not looking up, we start looking down and give up. Krishna is there and Krishna will reward. Krishna will manifest. Krishna will protect. So Krishna appears in the darkest of times. And similarly, sometimes our life has, it's not necessary that life has to become dark before it becomes bright. But even when our life seems to be extremely dark and there seems to be no hope that light will come, Krishna can bring light at that time. So we never lose hope. Even in the dark. And a third level of allegorical significance over here is that Vasudeva and Devaki, they were locked in a cell. Now, God appearing in this material world itself is the infinite and the unlimited hearing within the finite space and time of this world. Something extraordinary. And Krishna showed Arjuna the Virat Rupa that Krishna was in this world on a chariot in one city, in one country, in one planet, in one planetary system, in one universe. Krishna was within the universe and yet the universe was within him. So Krishna's appearance in this material world with its finite time and space say itself is miraculous. But Krishna appearing in a prison cell is so stunning that Krishna is ready to appear even in the darkest of places. The prison cell is a humiliating place. Somebody is, somebody we ask somebody, you know, okay, where were you born? I was born, so I was born in a jail. What? Why are you born in the jail? What happened? Krishna was born in the jail. But he appeared and the shackles broke off. Shackles broke off so that you know, he was taken out of the chair. So for all of us, when Krishna appeared in our hearts, the Vasudeva and Devaki were the cell, Krishna appeared in that cell. So our heart, we, our heart may seem to be like in a cell right now. It's like it's caught in its attachments, just not able to come out. The shackles that are binding us to the various attached, various things in this world. Krishna appears. Krishna can just remove shackles in one moment. What we may struggle to do for a long, long time, Krishna can just do in one moment. It's Krishna's great potency. So, at the allegorical level, this symbolism is in Krishna. Lila. And that symbolism doesn't mean that the literal story is not true. Literal story is definitely, things did happen like that. But there is additional level of meaning. The last level is the devotional level. 
now the devotional level we did discuss some things over here but i conclude with this the devotional level we see everything that happens ultimately as krishna's leela everything is arranged for the reciprocation of love between krishna and his devotees and whatever danger is there whatever dangerous characters are there they are all like props or special effects in the drama just to enhance the excitement the suspense of the drama so within that region kamsa is a demon well yes of course he's a demon but kamsa also has the back story that them demons also have their back stories or sudev and devki have their back story and the maharaj and you should i have their back stories but ultimately through various trajectories they have come here they are characters in this leela so for at this level we focus on this amazing past time this divine reciprocation of love there's a great like i tell there's a great test of love for osudev and devki there's a great reward of love at the end so ultimately at the leela level it is understood that love is the highest reality it is krishna's love for us that is the highest reality the more we develop our love for krishna then we also gain entrance into that highest reality we gain the means to rise above the realities of this world oh this is happening to me this person spoke like this this problem came over here this person did like this this all may be operationally true but there is a higher reality for us we see when we come to the leela level the leela is not just something the devotional level it's not just something that happened at that time yes, it did happen at that time but it's happening even now so the devotional level krishna leela is like a trailer for us so sweetly krishna is also talking about the devotees how selflessly the devotees the fighting for krishna so who's there is the trailer this is the wonderful world of love we actually long for that we actually belong to is what we want to go towards so trailer is like a trailer for us the divine, the world of divine love is being demonstrated so that we can be attracted and there's a trailer we watch a trailer the trailer is good oh i want to watch a full movie watching the full movie is purifying us and entering into krishna's abode and that's where krishna leela is not just a trailer it's also a trail trail means the path so for us remembrance of krishna itself comprises the path by which we'll go towards krishna the sense of bhakti is to make our memory our treasury it is for a devotee remembrances of the memories of krishna they become the wealth of the heart he of the devotee toward krishna krishna went away from vrindavan but he left a wealth of memories and those memories sustain the gopis those memories sustain the rajwasis so for us when we are celebrating janmashtami let us pray that this day become an opportunity for us to get a little bit more of the treasure of the memories of krishna and thus more and more of our memories will become krishna centered when we have bad memories of this person doing this or we ourselves doing something terrible or this terrible thing happening and those memories are there then when they are the memories that are there that is not a treasury that's a trouble house for us we want to have krishna memory and bhakti is about the more our memories are filled with krishna the more they give us joy in this life the more they draw us toward krishna we remember krishna asma sarveshu kale shuma manusmara we remember krishna in this world and then anta kale jamame smaran mukta kale remember the krishna the treasury of memory of krishna that is the treasury that is our ex life insurance people buy life insurance but bhakti is about getting that next life insurance that is making our memory our treasury i think 
very rich memories of Krishna in our heart. Letting our mind go toward those memories again and again. If what is, defines a treasury, it's not just that it is valuable, it is that we appreciate also that it is valuable. Somebody the treasury, not only they keep it carefully, but they keep watching it. Is it there? Is it there? Something has happened to it. So like that, when, when our memory becomes a treasury, we really acquire the memories of Krishna, but we treasure them. We keep going back to them. We keep revisiting them, recollecting them, replaying them. That's we show Krishna that. Now you are what I want. You are what I value. Than anything else in this world. And when we show Krishna that, Krishna has no reason to keep us in this world anymore. He will draw us back to him. He will appear in our hearts, make us as if we are living in the spiritual world while we are in this world also. And then, ultimately, he will take us to the spiritual world. I will deliver you. Not after a long time, soon I will do it, Krishna says. It's Krishna's supreme love. I quickly summarize what I discussed today. So we talked about Krishna Leela at four different levels. First, I introduced the four levels. It's from Bhaktivinoda Thakur's analysis of Kanishtha, Madhyama and Uttama. So, the Kanishtha see things simply stories for entertainment. The Madhyama look for non-literal meanings. And the uh, Uttama look at the devotional level. They are focused only on Krishna and they seek ecstatic absorption. So at the literal level, we discuss how the story is so dramatic and traumatic. And how there are things happening in Vrindavan and Mathura. And there is so much suspense and so much uh, intrigue. All those things are there. It's fascinating, profoundly entertaining story. At the ethical level, I discuss three things. First is that the prize for great service. If you want to do a great service, you have to pay a great price. That is what Vasudeva and Devaki paid uh, for that service. Then, also for how Krishna reciprocated and rewarded them. There is Visha, but after the poison, there is nectar at the end. And the nectar will be wonderful when it comes. At the ethical level, you also discuss like, Kamsa like people will be there in the world. And if we happen to fall in their kshetra, sometimes they have a big kshetra and we just happen to be in their kshetra. So if this is a demon and sometimes even a good person, a devotee, may be in their kshetra, so they have to suffer for some time. A devotee doesn't lose faith. Just as Vasudev Devaki maintained faith, he also maintained faith even in such difficult times. And then Lastly, at the ethical level, we also discussed about how in Krishna there are always various characters who are working in different ways. And for Sudev Devki, they had to play their role. Kamsa played his role. Then I discussed at the, at the allegorical level, we discussed about the six, the six children of the six Anarthas. And we talked about how in a darkness Krishna appears. So life may be very, very tough. And there Krishna appears. And second is, we talk about in the prison cell Krishna appears. So these two are slightly different things. One is that we are facing great difficulties and we don't know how to get out of The other is our attachments themselves are causing us great difficulties. There are external situations and there are attachments. So both of them, Krishna frees us from them. And then last, I discuss at the devotional level that this is the reciprocation of extraordinary love. We talked about Krishna as the ideal child and how he always reciprocated love with the parents. So this is like a trailer and a trail. Trail means we make our memory our treasury. And thus, we realize that love is the highest reality. Krishna's love for us is acting through all the difficulties that we are going through. And if we focus on developing love for Krishna, then we'll also go through those difficulties beyond them to Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.